All right, welcome to Trust the Journey. I'm Melanie Curtis. And I'm Jason Moletsky. <laughs> yeah. Our mission is to live, laugh, love, and learn together with you. We're here to make conscious connections, to grow, and to contribute through our practice of openness, honesty, vulnerability, humility, and trust. It's a real, real thing. Like, that's the actual reason why we do this. Yep. Yeah. Trusting the entire journey. Trusting the entire journey. Holy crap. <laughs> it's like reiterate that every single week. But yeah, guys, if you want to follow us on the internet, uh, on our other channels, go to trustthejourney.today. That's our Instagram as well. Feel free to join us in the Trust the Journey family. Reach out via DM anytime. We always are open to hearing from you and we love getting feedback and, and insight and ideas for future episodes or how our sharing has helped or impacted you. So please feel free to do that anytime. Okay, so today we are going to dive into something a little, I guess, less deep, but uh, we're going to be sharing our best travel tips in COVID times and out because we have a fair bit of experience traveling and <laughs> Jay's, <laughs> Jay's uh, hand just went completely over his face. No kidding. Uh, and it's a different world, you know, so I don't know. We thought we would just kind of talk about it because as I reenter as a, you know, traveler, I'm starting to have that experience again. And yeah, we just wanted to talk about that and hopefully share some value both for now and just kind of always. But yeah, does anything stand yeah. out as a place to start for you? Well, I guess a little like history is a kind of a good idea. I feel like, um, you know, for our audiences, for those who have just joined us, maybe don't know anything about our pasts, kind of cluing in. Um, myself, I started traveling uh, about 20, Five, 26, 26 years ago. 26 years ago is when I started skydiving, and that was when I really started traveling too. I started coming to the US uh, on regular to go skydiving. And the idea of going to a different country to go do a sport was a huge concept for, you know, a local boy when you're a kid, you know, 20 something. And you're like, oh my God, I'm going to go to the other side of a different country. You know, it just, it is the adjacent country, but it's still thousands of miles away to go participate in a sport that I could participate in right down the road. So why, you know, and then, and then inside of that career for myself, at least I went from traveling the entire North America highway system by by road to becoming an international traveler for decades and traveling all over the world to, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 or 50 countries now. And so, yeah, living out of backpacks and bags for months at a time, even spending one year, I just got a storage unit, got two roller bags and a backpack, and that was me for the year. Wow. You know, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, there's a scope of experience here. For sure. A little bit. Yeah, a little, a little bit. bit. Yeah. My, uh, yeah, to give my, I guess, short travel background, I, I feel like it would, the big, like, feeling I could, like I could go really away from home <laughs> was when I traveled abroad and studied in Australia in college. That was a huge deal, you know, to go internationally, not Canada, right? Not driving across the border, but getting on a big giant commercial jet, flying across an ocean, that type of thing. So that really opened my experience level. And yeah, skydiving definitely was the key for me to travel more. It was for me more in my professional skydiving years, like we talked about last, a couple weeks ago. Um, so yeah. But it's amazing. When I did start traveling, it was a lot. Like I got a fire hose of experience in a short period of time. And I literally just was, I was on a hike this week talking to somebody and I said, I, it's strange. I was sharing about how it felt strange to me, but, but it, well, not felt strange. It seems strange to me that I feel so incredibly at home in 
Sky Club, the Gels at Sky Club. I feel so incredibly at home in a commercial jet, in an airport. Like that's, it feels very comforting to me in a way to be there because I've traveled so much. So anyway, that's, that's that's something. That's a perfect starting point. You know, one of the things that has come up for me, there's something that I've realized in my own experience just as a human, right? Like not specific to traveling, but just how do I relate to my own human experience is that because I've spent so much of my life at least migrating north and south with the seasons for years, I would go north, south, north, south, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter to follow the skydiving season, right? And then, and the skydiving work, and then that turned into traveling internationally on that same agenda where you go to the Southern Hemisphere and you go to the Northern Hemisphere in the two different seasons. And then what I realized was I would tell myself this story like, um, oh, yeah, well, I travel a lot in the summer. It gets really busy in like May, June, July, August, September. But then I'll, I'll slow down in the winter. I'll stay home in the winter. And that's just a load of bullshit. It just started traveling more and more and more all the time. But if, like you... There's a certain at home feeling to being on the road. There's something about being mobile, about the journey per se. Yep. yep. <laughs> Trusting it, about being on that journey. There's something lighter about it. Like there you were not as anchored to any predictable outcome. There and the irony in that is there's it's very predictable, but it's more there's a lot more variety there's a lot more change there's new things all the time so yeah yeah there's some comfort in it totally totally it's a fascinating thing it really is uh you know and and i was you know writing a list for this episode and and trying to because i'm so often will go down the deep dive rabbit hole as will you so it's like i really tried to come up with some pragmatic like literal things that I do that make my travel experience more comfortable, that make me feel more at home. And this is, you might find this funny, but, or you might have the same practice. I definitely have like a travel outfit. I have like a travel uniform. It's not the same exact thing every time, but it's a pair of jeans. It's a black long sleeve shirt that's like comfy, sort of, you know, Lulu top that goes down long over the back of my jeans and my totally amazing boots that I love because I like to feel like I look kind of hot while I travel. (laughs) I know that sounds silly, but it's something that makes me feel good. And so I do it. And those boots are comfortable. It's not like I'm hurting myself. I could run through the airport in them. The point is, is that they're a piece of my little fashionista self. Just another thing that makes me feel good while I, while I move. And obviously, you know, other functional things like my backpack that can also be where I put my purse. I don't have to bring a purse, but it carries my laptop and all of my things. Having a real strong backpack has been super key. But the the outfit really has been, it's it makes me feel good every time I put it on. And I, I brought consciousness to it, not super, like, not forever, but it's fairly recent that I, like a couple years ago, I was like, I always wear this same thing. And I'm like, yes, I do that on purpose. I love it. Sort of like Steve Jobs. <laughs> so, so what's the pants that you have? Just a pair of jeans. Just a jeans? pair Just a pair of jeans. Yeah, like a comfortable pair of jeans and my awesome boots and a, and a black or, or a long sleeve sort of like a exercise top that has like the thumb holes, but that goes down long in the back. That's, that's what I wear. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, and it's a black top. Off, mo- almost always, it's a black top because that is in line with my fashionista self. Because I'll wear some kind of accessory potentially, or not, it just depends. Mm. But I really do like the look of the black and the mm. jeans and the boots. <laughs> I'm almost the same. I have a black Oakley T-shirt that's got like a black on black print that I absolutely love it because of its comfort. The reason I wear it is it's the most comfortable shirt that I own. And it has a certain fashion element to it. And the way that it fits is is just right on point for me. 
And I stay away from jeans myself. I don't like the how they can be tight or binding. I much prefer to wear a pair of my synthetic pants that are like um, outdoor active type clothing and they're very breathable, yep. um, very stretchy. They've got four-way stretch. There's lots of flex and I like the pocket arrangements where the back pockets don't have any bulk to them at all. There's no buttons or bulky corners or anything like that. So when I'm sitting on them for eight or 10 or 13 hours, they don't start to bother me. Yep. And on the front, it's got just the right size pockets to be able to put my passport in and my wallet and things that are gonna be staying comfy and convenient. And most importantly for me is the, the comfort and the breathability. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. The same thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. And for sure, the shirt is, is full comfort. The, another thing around the shoes, and this is also, I used to wear this one pair of shoes, which you know, it's pictured in one of my books because I wore them literally all the time. I was sort of known for these wild, awesome shoes. They're, I love them. I'll, yeah, so just write the, me. The, the book, the shoes, when, when Melanie gifted me a copy of her book, she handed me the book and she's like, I'd want to give you something. It was so cute. And it was just adorable. <laughs> she's giving me this little moment where we're sharing and we're being a team. And she's presenting me her book that she just finished it. And I flipped through the pages and there's this picture of her boots. And I'm looking at the picture and I look down, she's got them on and she's standing in the same posture as the boots are portrayed in the book. So it's like, there's this line drawing of the boots and I look down and there's Melody with her cute little smile and and the boots are standing exactly the same as they're drawn in there and I just had to it just touched my heart it was so, <laughs> so adorable what a moment I will not forget that moment that's for sure but the I, I when the pragmatic part of those types of shoes like the boots I have actually a new pair of boots that I wear traveling now but part of it is that they have a reason like a heel not that I'm wearing heels but that because my lower leg is short, I need a heel, a little bit of a heel, to have it not feel like my knees are dangling, like my lower leg is dangling. And so it helps me, like my knees used to really hurt. If I wore regular sneakers with flat bottoms, it would, my knees would kill. Even on a like two, three hour flight, I'd be like, ow. So when I elevated just my knee a little bit, it helped a ton. So that's also partly why I wear shoes like that. So one of the ch reasons why I choose my outfit the way I do, I have a, a couple of things that go along with it. I like to wear Vans, a really comfy, flat-soled skate shoe. They're super easy to slip on and off without undoing laces because of the design with the big fat tongue on them. And I have a nylon belt with a carbon fiber buckle so that there's no metal on anything. So my outfit is specifically chosen that when I walk through a metal detector or any of the scanners or anything, that it's not gonna ping any of the sensors and I don't have to take anything off. If, yeah. if I don't have to take shoes off, then they're not gonna, they don't have metal shanks or anything like that where I'm gonna have to take them off. So as a travel tip poor Jay, I, purposefully choose all the things I'm going to wear so that it eases my experience going through the TSA or the security experience. Yep, totally. Absolutely. My my boots that you mentioned from the book, those were slip on, slip off. And the boots that I wear now have an easy zipper on the side. So they're same thing, easy to get on and off. They're definitely not things I can wear through a scanner. I mean, maybe they would let me. I lost my TSA pre-check with my achieving, my goal achievement of traveling less a few years ago. And uh, I haven't figured out, I haven't like put it on my list to get it back, you know, to do a uh, global entry or anything like that. I mean, I would actually be curious about that if you have it. Yeah, I do. I use global entry. For me, it's well worth taking the time, even if I use it one time in a year, the value of taking the time to go to the airport when I'm and to go get my security pass done and sit in the office and do whatever's necessary for the few hours I have to invest into it. If I get to skip a massive, huge line of Disney kids and families that are, it's hot and there's all these screaming kids and they're over their vacation already and they're just cranky and tired. If I get to just skim past that line because I've done the work to 
go get my global entry so that I can have my TSA pre-check. Hells to the yeah. Nice. I'm going to do that. It sounds totally awesome. I really just haven't prioritized it. It's one of those things on my to-do list that has consistently it's, stayed down the hierarchy. It's good for like five years or some long period of time. So it's well worth it for the you know the couple yeah. hours you might have to spend to go get it done. You yeah. can just also time it to do it when you're at the airport, when you're going to have a long layover right. or you have to go pick somebody up at the airport. Yeah. Like if you've got something like that, some friends coming in and you say, okay, I'll go get my global entry. I'll show up a couple hours early, go to the office, take care of it then. Highly advise it, especially if you do a lot of international travel. The thing when you're getting off of a long international flight and you're coming back into the country, and if you always feel I don't know. I always feel just hammered. Like I'm sore from sitting so much and I'm usually dehydrated from being on the plane. Even though you try to stay hydrated, you don't want to be good enough to go pee all the time. And so being able to walk straight to the global entry machine and then just scan your fingers and look at the thing and have your picture taken and walk right through the passport check-in and totally skim that like every single time, ease of entry, ease of exit, absolutely worth it. I entirely believe you. I just, and I completely believe you. I think that I, yeah, yeah, done. Yeah. Enough said. Um, are you a backpack the, person? I'm going back to the gear part of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm a solid backpack user. I'm very particular about my type of backpack and how I choose it and why, I'm having really, gone through dozens of them. I want to hear what yours is because mine, my awesome one that I have now is on its last legs, and so I might be in the market. Hang on. <laughs> Jay's getting it. <laughs> Perfect. I definitely want to see this. Oh, I'm excited. Okay, so I use, this is, this is my second Thule. Okay. Right. So it's the Swedish brand. Love Thule, it. T-H-U-L-E. Um, this is my second bag from them. Um, they have a wide variety of different sizes. The reason why I've chosen to buy this stuff again is because the last one that I chose from them lasted almost 10 years. Amazing. And my other bags, everything that I get from... Um, you know, your typical shops here, like no one, but like Victoria Knox bags mm -hmm. or your typical travel store, one, two years, yeah. one or two years of use. And then the stitches start coming apart. The buckles start falling off. The clasps aren't working. Yeah. Things break. And so this bag, believe it or not, is probably in the five to six years old range. Nice. And the only reason I replaced it is because all my zipper pulls started to come apart on the last one. Um, I love bags with some outside pockets mm -hmm. on the side yep. to be able to put a water bottle in to mm -hmm. get to very easily because, you know, the whole thing with water on traveling is you got to drink it or pour it out. Um, so I like it to be on the outside of the bag so it's easy for me to remember to deal with that yep. problematic thing. Mm -hmm. And then I really like the way that they do storage. So there's always this extra little flap on the outside, which is an expandable pocket so I can shove jackets and hats yep. and things that I don't want to wear. And they always have the sunglass pocket on top. I'm a glasses wearer. I need mm -hmm. that place to store some goodies. And of course a laptop. And I really like the way they do their pocket layouts and I'm a, high, a big fan of Thule. I'm, tool. I'm feeling tool. the the excitement at a potential purchase <laughs> um, so that's the dopamine we were yep. talking about on trust the jury family the other day right you're like Ooh, yes. my future there might be something that makes me happy oh my god that video is so good i mean so it's so on point but that's another thing but yeah seriously to guys for real join us in the trust the journey family shameless plug don't care um but yeah i have a north face backpack which has been great it's a little bit too long for my body um, but I like how the storage that it has, I like, it's good quality too. Um, but there are some parts of the inside that's ripping and, you know, the, a little bit of the stitching on the outside is coming out, coming apart and it's probably three and a half years old. So it's, you know, not terrible, but you know, it's not, it's not the perfect backpack for my body. Um, that's key, right? Your torso length, if you, from your shoulder to the top of your uh, pelvis on the back, your sacrum, that length in there is going to determine which bags are appropriate for you. Because if you're going to be walking those corridors, <coughs> going from 
flight to flight or whatever, you're going to be, what probably going to happen is you're going to be curling over or it's going to be hanging backwards. And it's really going to affect your overall posture and experience of traveling. If it's comfortable and it fits well, your exercise opportunity between the flights can be something that's positive and you get this nice little, you know, stroll down the, um, what do you, what do you call these things? Big long that we, corridor. Corridors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <The> terminal. <laughs> Terminals. Yeah. 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 From terminal to terminal. Right. Yeah. So like, um, I go through Atlanta all the time and it's like a couple miles from yeah. one terminal to another. If you take advantage of the hike that you can do instead of riding the, the subway or the bus or whatever it's called there, the right. Marta. Yeah. Yeah. And before I forget this, this sort of goes with the outfit and the functionality. But yeah, I definitely wear a jacket every time because I get cold. Even if it's hot where I am, I make sure to have a jacket. Uh, In the winter, I have just one of my sponsor jackets, which I really love because they have these awesome side pockets and they have a front pocket sort of up by sort of like your heart where that's where I put my license, my boarding pass, my passport, whatever, in that pocket up here, which I like a lot. Um, If it's too hot for that type of jacket, I will wear just sort of a, you know, Patagonia shell with big side pockets because they have big zippers on the side and you can easily fit a bunch of stuff in those side pockets, even though they're only two, you know, side pockets. That works well for a non-winter too warm scenario for me but on the plane I need a jacket because if I don't have a jacket I almost inevitably always get cold yeah, I think for me it depends where I sit I'll often take the exit row and the exit row is always colder than everywhere else on the plane because some air leaks in the doors as the cabin is positively pressured there's always air coming inside through that crack um so it'll it'll get cold in those seats and i although i run hot and i'm typically like i'm sitting here right now in shorts and a collared shirt which i wear because they breathe more yeah um and i'm sweating just sitting here right now <laughs> right. in my office you know you're not uh, alone my friend yeah i have shorts and and a sh- t-shirt on too and i'm sweating as well so i carry a patagonia jacket as well and but i take the micro puff yeah it's me like too. a a synthetic, puffy, I mean, like outdoor mountain jacket. And I love it because it collapses down so small it, when you want to put it in my bag and pack it away. I can also use it for lumbar support if I roll it up and make it just, just great for, a, for an airplane seat that's not comfortable and doesn't really offer me the lumbar support I need. I can also put it on backwards sitting yeah. in the seat. I'll do that or I'll just drape it over my knees as a blanket. Um, the other thing that comes along with my my jacket is a couple things. In my bag, I almost always have a travel mug. I take a coffee travel mug that has a screw on top that has a press button to be able to open it to be able to drink. Uh-huh. And that way, I can have a big cup of coffee that will last me for like the whole flight and it'll stay hot for the whole flight and I can have it whenever I want. Um Or I can put a cold drink in that same mug, but I really like having my own travel mug and not being dependent upon having a water bottle or something else. I'll I'll often have water on the side, but I like my hot drink and something to sip on and not having to wait for the, you know, the cabin attendant to come around. I can be, it's already have my yummy, uh, you know, espresso or whatever I I want in there. Totally get it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh get it from the perspective of having your drink already ahead, which again, I, The Sky Club, in COVID times, it's different because it's so changed. It's like not really there for people anymore. A lot Mm -hmm. of them are closed and they're not able to offer the same type of of amenities and food and stuff like that. Like, I am not joking. The amount of money that I have saved over the years by having a Sky Club membership like having a Delta Reserve card and getting paying that annual fee, but getting all those miles and getting all of the, you know, getting my entry to the Sky Club and all of that. I have saved so much money in food alone, coffee alone. And you don't drink. So if, I you're, don't a, even, if you're yeah. a drinker, 
if you're a drinker, you get free drinks at the Sky Club. So the amount of money, if you person has type of person who has a drink when you're traveling, that's you're gonna and you travel a lot, just in that alone will pay for the membership. The, yeah. the food is actually pretty dang good most of the time as well. It I really use it as is. well. Yeah. 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 So, but anyway, I'm I'm in the process of of determining what new life looks like. You know what I mean? I've only done, gone on one trip at, in, in the times of COVID, um, and I'll be going on my next trip on Sunday. Yeah, J Zero. What? So the my data set for what it's like out there is quite low at this point, but. Um, I am happy to report that I didn't feel scared, that I felt like Delta, which is my airline. And that's another thing is that I oh, I absolutely highly recommend a, choosing an airline and being a part of their rewards program. Delta does an awesome job. I actually really, really love, love them. They've done me well many for many years. And in COVID times, they are still doing the really sort of safe plane numbers you know you're always going to have an open seat next to you and stuff like that that feels to me just so much safer than having a full airbus you know i don't i don't know i'm just not quite there yet in my own comfort if that makes sense definitely i've carried a a, a bandana or a mask or something to cover my face for years and years and years because i can't tell you the number of times that i've been sitting on a plane and had a person next to me sneeze, you know, as we all do. Yeah. And they're, they just happen. You just ka-doomf, and you sneeze, and then you have the sun shining in the window, and there's the whole vapor cloud yeah. filling up the cabin. And that's happened to me numerous times where I've often, pretty much always, have a bandana in my bag, and it's sitting right in the top of my book bag. And so on that on the book bag there my glasses and my bandana stay in that same pocket right at the top so it's super accessible yep. so i can easily just pull it out and put it on over my face or put it over my eyes and um i like that bag to be able to fit comfortably under the seat in front yeah. i think that's one of the things about choosing a book bag that if it's a little too bulky it's not going to fit under there well and especially once you shove it full of things you know you put jackets and computers and all the other stuff in there and a snack and everything and now it's not going to fit so you got to choose a bag that's small enough that it limits your potential at least me no it's I true gotta i gotta limit my potential there well and that's another thing there's the the whole school of thought of do you check your bags do you try to carry everything on years ago and this is because of skydiving i absolutely surrendered i gave in because i traveled so much there was no effing way that i was gonna carry stuff on like i check everything i love checking it all take it away thank you kind kind sir at the desk and i walk away with my backpack and then i'm in this very comfortable and you mentioned that comfort that's definitely a piece of it the every piece of the things that i'm talking about absolutely have a comfort element as well so yeah it, i always put my bag in this under the seat in front of me because i loathe people trying to get on really early to get the overhead bin space like that is not a fight that I'm ever gonna choose to be a part of <laughs> unless I have to for some weird reason but I always avoid the overhead bins I always use the seat in front of me space so that I'm just this pod of simple peace and, <laughs> and light <laughs> for those around me and myself Absolutely agree. Yeah. yeah. You know what I do for comfort? What? And this is an odd one. It's not, I would say that this is probably a non typical thing, but this comes from my hiking and camping and just being all oftentimes on a low budget travel, exp um, you know, journeys, not having the money for, say, to get a hotel room when you're on an eight or 10 hour layover. You're like, oh, I'm not going to put out hundreds of dollars for an airport, especially if you're on an international layover where you'd have to leave to go through security and come back again. It's just not going to happen, right? Yeah. No. I had a, I had one just a little while ago. Actually, my last trip before COVID, I had some terrible layover, which was like 12 or 14 hours in Gatwick oh. in London. And I carry a really cool item it's called a neo air and it is a camping sleeping pad 
and I have slept on one of these things uh, uh, like a year worth of my life I have on one of these pads. Wow. Easily. More than a year. More than a year. And that pad rolls up to just bigger than the, like a can of soda. Wow. So it's it's like six inches tall and about three or four, three and a half inches across. So wow. it's a little, when you roll it up, that's it. It's like literally like putting a can of Coke in your bag. And when you inflate it, it's like two and a half inches thick and full body length. So I will pull this thing out at any gate and I will go over to a corner and I'll blow that thing up and I'll lay down and I'll pull out my travel pillow, which I'll also blow up. I like having these sea to summit blow up camping pillows and I will go lay down and take a good old snooze, like a proper <laughs> nap, a few hours nap. I'll have my arm in my book bag, right? So that my book bag's connected. Yep. And but I'll be able to get a few hours of proper sleep while I'm on a layover because I have somewhere to lay down because I don't sleep sitting up. I'm not the kind of person who can sleep. And so the I'm usually tortured by the time I get off the plane because I haven't had any rest. And the minute I can lay down and get horizontal, my body thanks me so much for that. Nice. So that that extra piece of equipment, which is unusual, is a lifesaver, especially on unexpected layovers or in airports where there's they make it so you just can't be comfortable no matter how hard you try oh i know i mean i definitely can sleep on planes but i don't always it's hit or miss I, it depends on how tired i am definitely again relative to the the gear and functionality is in times of covid you're wearing a mask and stuff like that but the hood i will have the hood on my on my jacket so like when I'm wearing the winter jacket, I almost I always have that Patagonia shell because that's underneath my winter jacket if I'm wearing the winter jacket. But what's awesome is it has a hood and if I want to be not talked to or completely ignored or go to sleep, I put that hood on my head and on my eyeballs and I'm like just gone. Like clearly it's a you're not allowed to talk to me signal. <laughs> It's, 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 that's an excellent tool. <laughs> yes. It's excellent. Yeah. yeah I mean, headphones, but... headphones are ser- somewhat valuable for that. Like you can put your headphones on and that says, hey, I'm in my own world. Don't bother me. But some people don't get it. Some people are just, right. just so interested in their own experience that they just ha- don't necessarily pay attention to what's happening for you. Right. It's so true. And uh, yeah, but I don't always sleep. I sometimes sleep. I really try to avoid red eyes now because they really brutally just annihilate me for the following week, which is not uh, balance-wise of value. That loss after a red eye flight is not worth what the time I would save Um, unless I feel like I really want to get home and there's like a super, super high value of me not staying an additional night where I am because I have this real uh, now wanting to be home feeling. And so if I I want to honor that, then I might choose a red eye and just choose that I will be lazy and wear my pajamas for three days after I get home and work from my bed, like that type of thing. But otherwise, I really try to avoid the red eye. Um... But this is something relative to the sleeping that I wanted to share is sometimes I definitely will watch movies, you know, definitely will take advantage of the in-flight entertainment thing, which is awesome when when it's on there. But with that, I am intentional about either using it or not, but when I do and pretty much always, I am using my flight as a way to disconnect from being connected. So I almost virtually never, I think I've done it twice in my entire life, have I gotten the in-flight internet. And I deliberately don't because I get so much value from the experience of being disconnected, the peaceful couple of hours or few hours when I am not online. I would pay money to go sit in a sky club for three or four hours because my phone is off and all I'm going to do for that period of time is build a mix. I will build a DJ mix sitting at one of those office desks in the corner 
where I've got my little space. I'm outside of my regular working environment. I'm not tapping into any Wi-Fi. I'm not, my phone's off. And I've got this place where nobody's looking for me. I'm off the grid per se yep. because I'm engaged in travel. Yep. And I can dedicate that period of time that I have to working on a personal passion project, something that's artistic and creative that I care about, that engages me and gives myself a return during a time when you need to be, like when you're traveling, requires you to follow a lot of rules and regulations, right? Like you have to match the schedule of all the other things that are happening. That's not your schedule. It is the schedule. You have to, you know, dress a certain way. You can only have so many things. There's all these variables involved. With COVID, it's even more of a stress. So giving myself something on the creative side to do is a huge value. Uh, I'm sure for some people that's even just reading a, a book, right? Just having the time to read a book because we just don't make the time in our lives so often to take the time to just sit and read. You yeah. Know? Yeah. For me, I have written countless, I mean, not countless, but I have, I have written many of my columns. So my monthly columns for Blue Skies Magazine, uh, many times, if you actually read my book, How to Fly, it is, you will read a number of different columns that are written from the a commercial jet. Like mm -hmm. it's just, there's a lot of different columns that I write because it's this, ah, uh, I totally agree with you. It's this interesting openness that helps my creativity fire and it's for me, travel always feels like access to freedom. And so that's partly why when it was becoming for me more like work and I didn't want to do it as much, I was losing that connection to freedom that I always felt when I was in motion. And so that's when I knew for myself I needed more balance in my life in terms of how much I was traveling and for what purposes I was traveling. And so, yeah, now that I, even on this last trip, I was comforted, certainly comforted to feel safe, physically safe for my health relative to COVID. Um, it was, there was a little discomfort because some of the things that I'm used to having were not available. Sky Club is, is an example, but other ways of like, how do you buy food? Like, what is it, you know, all the, th like just the newness of using hand sanitizer, just the, those little things. It's not a big change. Um, but that was a little bit of growth discomfort in terms of this is what's new, you know, obviously wanting to resist small things like that because I don't want to do that, right? But getting through that, but even after doing that and having those sort of little resistances and a little, and the fear uh, dissolving and just the dis desire not to wear a mask but of course I'm definitely in the camp of wearing a mask and keeping people safe that's I'm a believer in that um with all that sort of on the other side of the of me I was still able to feel very peaceful very free and very creative and so that was awesome for me to feel on this first trip sort of back in this new world um so yeah I'm just happy to feel that because that's one of the main things that I really really value in the movement travel experience so i want to touch on a couple of things that you were, were um that brought up thoughts for me there one of them is um just to give our listenership some perspective and and for you too mel yeah, is please. the last flight that i was on was in march right at the right when covid hit i'd been in finland i'd gone there to get some tattoo work done uh, I came back from Finland and everything was going into COVID craziness. Yep. And I was pretty concerned actually on that time because I could, there was tons of sick people on the plane and all these, and I was really stressed about it. And um, that was the last flight that I was on. That was in beginning of March. So now we're like April, May, June, July, August. That's five months yeah. that I haven't gone on a flight. And now this may sound funny to people because they're like, you know, a lot of people's perspective is like, man, maybe I fly once or twice a year. You know, I have my job. If I go anywhere, it's locally or a drive or I go on a family vacation once or twice in a year. I haven't gone five months without getting on a plane in 
20 years. Amazing, right? Maybe maybe two months. Fascinating. Two, two months without getting on a plane to fly somewhere would be a long time. Yep. You know, if I, I would be like, oh, yeah, I don't have anything on the schedule for the next two months, and then something would sneak in. Yep. Always something would sneak in. I need Always. to go somewhere for a weekend or a week or whatever it is to go do some job or make, you know, some appearance or some demo or some competition or who knows what. But always so five months of being at home and not traveling and not going anywhere has really been hard for me as an experience of being somebody who constantly moves and so you said this freedom this creativity i think one of the big reasons why i've decided to change my lifestyle is to allow myself this ability to be able to move freely again because i don't want to be locked down in this type of existence where I can't meander around and feel, you know, the, the freedom to change my scenery whenever I, whenever I want to. So that's a, a big influence there for, for me. I think that's kind of badass. You know what I mean? The, uh, the gifts and the change and the gifts and the experience. But yeah, I echo it too. I, it's, it's a little bit different for me in the sense that I was wanting to be home more. You know Same. what I mean? Yeah, yeah I, I have been actively staying home more over the last couple of years. It's been a conscious. And so when I say more, instead of being on the road up to six months in the year, I'd be on the road four or three months out of the right. year, you know? Yeah. Which is still big changes, but now it's almost completely eliminated, you know? So. Yeah. I want to throw something out. But yeah, please go, go. Okay. So this is my number one travel tip. Yes. Yeah, I've been thinking about it. I'm like, what's the most important thing? Like, if I could bring anything to the table from the last 25 years of global travel, and I don't consider myself to be an expert traveler, although most would, most people would. It's because I relate myself to people who have been to almost 200 countries. Yeah. You know, the people that I know that are just world traveling the entire globe. I think. The most important thing that you can be is incredibly nice. Oh, I love that. The nice, if we've all been at the airport and seen the person having the breakdown of their being an asshole to a service agent, whether it's at the TSA or at the check-in or the luggage or whatever, like whatever experience you're having, however that's going, it's going to be a direct mirror of you right and so the nicer that you are the friendlier the happier the more you just show up and just be like grateful for the for whatever comes the easier it's all gonna go and the 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 opposite the grumpier or the bitchier or the angrier you are you are gonna get that right back every single time and sometimes just worse than you could ever imagine and imagine those people who work there and they have to deal with people like us every single day all day long imagine being on the other side of that counter and maybe somebody's listening out there who works in the airport or works at one of these TSA securities or something and they're like oh you got you got no idea son you got no, <laughs> no you kidding know? no you kidding know? <laughs> Oh my gosh. No, that's, that's my so, number one. That's so on point. It's so incredibly on point. I mean, and I would invite people with that tip, which I completely echo a million times, duh. It goes to big life beliefs of be kind and be grateful. Everything is for us. That absolutely applies in the micro travel experience as well. And I think what for and I say novice travelers, again, not that I am some wildly experienced person in this realm either, Uh, but from the perspective of it is common for people to feel great stress when going to the airport, whether it's because of the rigid schedule, because there's so many pieces of that process that are out of their control, whether they're afraid of the security line or, or whatever. Whatever, any number of things that cause tension in a person. Um, In order to be able to stay very relaxed, very calm, very uh, within my scope of just gentleness for myself and the space around me, I always show up really fucking early. And I do it on purpose. And I tell you why is that 
I have a freaking iPhone. You know, I can do anything from anywhere. I can chill anywhere. What I can't do is chill when I'm trying to like make my flight. So like for me, that's a big, big thing. And I know some people are really averse to that because they're like, oh, they maybe have the perspective of, I don't want to waste my time at the airport. I just think that is complete bull roar. And it's worth looking at that idea to reframe it because if I have a pleasant, leisurely experience in the lines, I'd, lines don't even bother me. I don't give a fuck how long the line is because I got plenty of time to just chill. You know, so that's one of the biggest travel tips I would I would give too, because it connects to our ability to be kind and gentle with ourselves and everyone that we meet throughout that experience. Absolutely. You know what I'll also echo with that is that if you Jess have Rosen. familiarity with the people who you may <laughs> be traveling analogy. with, if there's people the that drop. you... Oh, did it totally stop? <laughs> it totally stopped. And I was like, I think Jay's frozen. <laughs> yeah. I started talking. Good. Um, Go ahead. Say it again. So... Then. I would often travel with the same people, groups of people, you know, coworkers, teammates, this kind of thing. And what I've learned is that different people operate on different schedules. And I'm like you, I like to be there with enough time where I'm never in a rush. And I don't, I've figured out, you know, how much time that needs to be for me. Yep. And other people have their, their ideas of what they need or miss just different ideas, right? And so I will avoid and say no thank you to a ride with somebody that I know runs later than me in order to avoid having to deal with the stress of being behind schedule based on my perception of what I need to feel relaxed and comfortable. Agreed. You know? Absolutely agreed. Like completely agreed. I think that's a really big one. Really, really big one. At least it is for me for my comfort and my sense of quote unquote controlling pieces that I can control. You Tell me if you do this or not. Yeah. Do you make friends with somebody every time you travel? No, I do not. So you know who I make friends with? Who? Somebody who works there. Nice. One of the cabin attendants, one of the gate attendants, one of the people at security, somebody who's there, I will try and connect with them, even if it's not to like get to know each other by name or whatever, but it's just to be like, hey, how are you doing today? You know, yeah. like, and actually ask them. And there's a difference between saying, how's it going? And just eyes diverting back to where you're going again. Yep. And actually asking and looking intently for the answer. We know the difference when somebody asks us. And so taking a moment to engage with somebody, especially in times like this where things are hard, having some human connection that we're each having our own experience here is a massive value to me. And I will often try to do that with the cabin attendant that I'm going to be spending time with yeah. over the next few hours. Or if it's a gate attendant that I see on regular, if I go to the same airport all the time, I'll definitely make a point to get to know people's names as they're going to get to know mine if I'm there all the time. Yeah. And I feel like that practice in that like being nice mentality and also c connecting is so valuable. I can't tell you how many times... I've made the point to be smile and say something nice to somebody and get the value connection going. And then when something goes wrong, like we're delayed or there's some problem, and the next thing you know, you're getting attended to and cared for by that person because you recognized their human experience in this journey and now it's coming back around again. And they're yeah. recognizing your human experience in the journey. And they're like, yeah, you were, you're good. Here you go, here's an extra you know, yeah. whatever. Right? right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. From a conscious perspective, I don't necessarily consciously do that or haven't done that consciously. But if I reflect on what I'm always trying to be for the staff is the person that is clearly uh, aware of the potential pain point they might typically have with other people, aka, exactly. aka, I express gratitude to them. I legitimately express gratitude to uh, someone helping me with what they do every day. So it's not that they're doing something extra for me. It's that I'm just grateful that they're helping me, and and that's sort of my way to acknowledge 
this has probably got to suck most of the time. I'm not saying that. It maybe doesn't. Maybe they have a great life experience. I don't know. I'm projecting. I get it. But that's something that I do for, for sure. You know what I mean? And then when something does go wrong, I am absolutely the person that it doesn't bother. I make that it very clear that I am not bothered by whatever would totally fucking freak out somebody else. Definitely. If the, the gratitude thing, that's the, that's the human connection piece, right? That's the saying, I see you. Yeah. I see you. I see you in your role here. I respect you and I appreciate you. Thank you for taking whatever simple actions you do on a daily basis to make this experience possible. So true. Right? It's so just true. possible. And so this true. is this time right here, like this stressful COVID time. I can't even imagine being in the airline industry and being worried about my future. If I have a retirement plan that's based in the airline industry and you're going, oh, oh yeah. my whole airline could possibly tank because of this change in how what's happening with the world. And, you know, all the, the time we have invested into our careers, you know, it's a time to be extra nice and Absolutely. extra consider and extra connecting and grateful for the people who are out there, whether it's a, you know person checking in checking to make sure that you're safe yeah you know or whether they're helping us on or on whatever it might be you know it's so true it's so true i mean i will say this like it, when i first started traveling a lot so when travel really exploded in my professional skydiving years uh like the sort of peak professional skydiving years i was so i was so taxed uh, being engaging with other humans that I sort of got on autopilot of travel is not a place I connect, right? I've definitely had those experiences where I'm sitting next to someone and we end up having a, a dialogue and we end up connecting and it's really cool. And you're like, whoa, that was kind of badass because I talked for two hours with some random stranger. I rarely have done that in my years, though. And it's not because I think that's not great, because that's actually pretty totally badass and cool. It's because I was, and this is something I'm just illuminating for myself now, is that my autopilot was disconnection because I was so connected in my work life that I used the travel to be in that bubble. I put the headphones in. I have the hood on. Don't talk to me. I don't want to connect with you was a lot of my uh, sort of uh, physical messaging. And I can actually totally revisit that now. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have to. I can really start to bring some consciousness and some just reflection to my travel experience now. And maybe I can connect more because I'm not living such an intense, full-on life where I'm leading a big groups of people every single weekend, that type of thing. So anyway, I'm just saying that like for me going forward, I, I want to open my mind and maybe I'll want to stay disconnected or maybe I won't, but I at least want to not be on autopilot around that. Yeah, I can absolutely echo everything you just said there. It's been basically the same experience for me too. I choose to have that time alone ironically it's like to be in amongst you know hundreds or thousands of people and be like no this is my alone time right you know? i know it's so weird <laughs> <laughs> my alone time yeah and um, also i've had the same thing where i've met some really interesting people and had some great conversations some of my favorites are with the most obscure or the most unexpected like I can think of having a conversation with a little old lady who sat down to me next to me one time, you know, she could have been my grandmother or great grandmother, you know, and then just in, in we just, oh, hi, how are you? And just something starts talking and then off you go. And then the whole flight, you know, just yeah. sharing. But I know, I wonder if you're the same or not, but I have often not allowed myself to share what I do for a living. Oh, no, I, I don't often do that. I keep my boundary. I'm like, oh, you know, I'll make up. I'll just say something that's like not quite saying I jump out of airplanes because that is the last thing that I want to talk about on an airplane. Yep. You know? Yeah, I am the same. It depends. You know, it really depends. If the, if the experience feels like I want to lean into it, then maybe I'll share. But rare, rare that I would bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. 
But There's lots of ways to describe what we do that doesn't include those words, skydiver yeah, the, or parachute. I, yeah. Totally. And I'll talk about life coaching or something like that. But again, I rarely do it. So it's like I don't actually have that high much of a data set. One of yeah. the one of the times I did and this is kind of funny too. It goes to that Maya Angelou quote of people will re- will forget what you said or forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. I uh one instance of when I did decide to have a conversation with someone we ended up like getting drunk and we, t- <laughs> we t- this is a while ago because obviously I don't drink anymore but I, we you know just drank the whole flight and we talked and it was really fun it was really really fun I do not have any from I have no memory of what we talked about I have I don't remember his name I think I have like a business card somewhere but the point is, is that we had a really fun time, you know, and that was, I totally remember that. I will not ever forget that. But the content, no no clue whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to share one of my, um, <laughs> one of my travel <laughs> stories. Okay. So I've traveled a lot. I've done a lot of things. I've tried a lot of things. I've gotten into plenty of adventures and I spent a week in Panama in Central America. And while I was there, I did a hell of a lot of cocaine, right? A oh, lot, no. you know, because oh that's what you do if you're of that type of mind in Central America or another Northern South America. And I had been a complete mess. I mean, we'd just been partying our faces off for days and I get into the airport and it's basically just dusting things off and getting to the plane and got on the plane and sat down and just went like, kaboom, like exhaustion, just exhaustion finally overtakes me. And I just pass out window seat, head against the wall and the plane. I mean, I, I've literally just boarded, sat down, clicked the seatbelt and passed right out. Wow. And I wake up five hours later. And I'm kind of dude like, oh my God, oh Jesus, I feel horrible because that's what cocaine makes you feel, horrible. Oh, and I'm sitting there and I'm like looking at the guy beside me and he's giving me this kind of smile and sneer, you know, just kind of a little glint. And he's like, you know, he knows exactly where I've come from because you don't just pass out on a first thing in the morning flight, you know. <laughs> and I look over, I'm like, where are we? Because we're sitting still, we're on the ground, you know. And he's like, we're still at the gate. And I'm like, what? What time is it? You know? And I figure out it's been over five hours that we've been sitting at the gate. We never took, we never left the gate. We just backed up, you know, and then parked. And we're totally stuck there still. And I'm like, oh my God. You know, like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, put my hand up for the server to come over and like, can I have a Bloody Mary, please? Oh my God. And he's like, make it too. Oh my God. (laughs) And we stand up chatting for hours after that, you know, like made some friend randomly. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my God. What a horrible experience. Oh God. It sounds rough. I mean, and this thing, I I didn't even touch on the world tour. You know, you're like, oh, I lived out of a backpack and two roller bags. I did five months with a backpack and, you know, and that is such an invaluable experience. It's so, I am so glad I did that. Even though it was so hard and all the things, it was, it's so awesome. The reason I say I'm so glad I did that is because of how capable I feel to completely let go of things. To just completely let go of things. I like my things. I just know that I don't really need them. And that is a f- piece of freedom that I have at my fingertips all the time. Whether I live in this beautiful, you know, giant apartment that we have here in New Jersey, I love this place. I'm all about it. I love having a big space and a big home. But yeah, it's just that's a really th- a beautiful thing that I've I've gra- like kind of taken from my travel is just that ability to be free in both mindset but also in physicality anytime i would choose it isn't it cool how you have to just take a few things like you can't take all your things right so you have to pick just your favorites or just the (laughs) ones that are good for this particular environment so you're forced to only select the things that are really going to bring you comfort or value and so because you reduce that total number of belongings down to such a small few items that you really only get what you need and what you value and what what you care about. Uh, and in doing so, there's a huge freedom that comes with it. There's a massive freedom. And so 
I recommend it to anybody, even if you're not traveling, go to your closet and do a pass through your closet and be like, if I was going on a trip, would I take this with me? And if not, get rid of it. Yeah. Just get rid of it. Like, don't own it anymore. Because if you wouldn't take it with you, why do you have it? Yeah. It's just weight that we're just letting anchor us down that would allow us to be more free energetically yeah. if we didn't drag it around with us. And that even just sitting in the closet, is it's dragging us down. It's true. Energetic weight. I actually yeah. highly recommend people watch the movie Up in the Air. It's a George Clooney movie. It's not that great of a movie, but it gives a lot more insight into the physical travel experience and the emotional travel experience. It's another just kind of asset for this type of, of consideration and dialogue. But yeah, otherwise, the only other thing I had on my list was get a suitcase with really, really good wheels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the last tip I had on my list, and I'm sure there's more, but do you have anything else that you would add, my friend? Well, I mean, obviously, we've both spent a lot of our time, our lives traveling, and an hour flew by without even a blink of an eye, without even trying. So we could talk about this for a very long time because it's something we've spent a lot of our lives doing. And I, I recommend to people travel travel like no matter what even if it's the time of covid like go travel where you have the opportunity to expand your horizon and change your perspective change your vantage point literally the place that you look at the world from right yeah. it changes who we are the more that we change our perspective or the position that we're looking at things from the more that it grows us and rounds us out and opens up the way that we're able to view and experience things. And I think that there's been no greater value in my life to helping globally contribute to who I am as a person than the opportunity that I've been gifted in this life to travel and to explore the world. It's amen. Agreed completely. All counts. And I say, if you can't get on a commercial jet, get in your car, take a yeah. car. You know, you don't have to be on the commercial jet. We just happen to have that as a majority of our experience. But yeah, I'm excited to hear more about your van as your new exciting life yeah. takes shape. And I'll keep you guys posted on the on my travel experiences as they kind of stack up as well. I'm curious. I'm curious yeah. to see how things are going to go. Yeah. Uh, cool. But we love you guys. Thank you for being with us as always. Uh, just, yeah, just really grateful for everyone listening. And if this was valuable to you and you feel like it would be valuable to someone else this episode or any episode please feel free and you know to share it share it whether you share it publicly or whether you send it to a friend privately you think it would help that is just a way to gift what you get from what we talk about here to someone else so subscribe on iTunes subscribe on our website a sign up for our email list on our website, uh, rate our podcast anywhere that, that you can rate it, uh, any feedback that you can give, any support that you can give to our efforts here to share our journeys and to connect and to grow and to be vulnerable and all that stuff that we say every week because we truly mean it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for laughing, being here. Keep laughing, keep loving, and keep trusting the journey. <laughs> <laughs>